PhD at uh, UC San Diego in 1991 in comparative literature and uh, began teaching at the uh, University of Birmingham in 1991, then University of Maastricht, and then moved to the uh, University of Amsterdam where she is today. There she's been uh, chair of the film, television, and media department, dean of the humanities, and now back in the civilian ranks as a, as a professor. Um, her essay's work started out in uh, really science studies, gender, uh, gender and science, questions of embodiment, questions of genetics, and then uh, shifted in the early 21st century, I think, to uh, questions of media as she moved into that department. Um, she's written five, six, six, thank you. But who's copying this um, Six books, edited a few others, uh, published, I think I counted over three dozen articles and four dozen book chapters, and has been a visiting professor or scholar at a number of prestigious universities, currently at the Annenberg School um, in Philadelphia at UPenn. Um, today she'll be talking about a very recent book. Culture of Connectivity, published by Oxford University Press. My pleasure. My history with C21 goes back to C20. I was here for the first time when this was tweet C20, and I was still really young. So that's a long time ago, but it was in the previous century. So. Uh, it's nice to be back, you know, although I don't recall having seen anyone from that era. So um, the book was indeed recently published and I would like to talk a little bit about what's in the book and introduce you to uh, what I've called a critical history of social media. Um, now, it's quite something to write a, a history of s an, a phenomenon that has only been into a, in existence for like 10 years, perhaps l just a little longer if you count, you know, everything. We may reach about 13 years, but that's about all. Some would call all these, you know, examples weapons of mass distraction. For me, they certainly are, and they have been, so that's why I quit some of them, because I couldn't, could no longer write because of these weapons of mass distraction. Some call them weapons of mass um, uh, disruption. Those were mo mostly talking about industries that have been disrupted and that have become completely upset by these new technologies. Um, They've been around for about a decade now, and new ones appear every day. Old ones, you know, are disappearing. And this is what I would call, you know, not just these that are here on the, on the screen, but a number, you know, thousands of these um, uh, websites that are online sites right now, uh, is what I would call the ecosystem of connective media. And I'm going to talk about how I came to call that an ecosystem. Um, the history of this, this media occurs very rapidly, you know. There's names on here that you would have expected to be there, like even a few years ago. Uh, remember Zanga, remember MySpace, remember, you know, I could mention like, you know, four or five of them that are no longer on there that you probably won't remember and in a couple of years everyone has forgotten. So that history is going very rapidly. Um, it's going this rapidly, you know, that there's this statistic, these statistics are actually about the um, uh, internet penetration, or actually these are the percentages of internet users in each age group who use social networking sites. And if you look at the figures, you see that the green line, it says that 76% of all internet users are now into social media. By the way, this is a 2012 statistics, it may be more now. Um, but particularly look at the youngest age group, like between 18 and 29, there's like an 83% penetration rate. That's the rate that for television to reach that, you know, took 20 years. So 
to see that happening within a time frame of let's say five or six years is really unprecedented. So that's some historical context that I would like to sketch because that is really important. Um, what is important about those, this, these sites is that they have <coughs> penetrated what we call offline so sociality and they're now like totally almost you know all of them are we call online that's what I call an online society and it's carried by a digital infrastructure a data driv driven and commerce driven data structure you know I can't look into the future I will not do any predictions but when little Emma who's now seven months old when she will be 18 we have just promised that you will use this recording today's recording and show it to her, to her when she's 18 and sort of do a historic reinterpretation of what I'm telling you today and I'm sure she will be laughing her head off really <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to meeting Emma in like 18 years and she tells me what she thinks so I will be happy to uh, know more about that um, when I started writing the book and starting writing the his what I call a critical history of social media I asked myself two questions and I know some of you are into a theory of, you know, more on a theoretical level into social media, some are not, but this is sort of pretty basic. If you want to know more about that, I, you know, recommend to read you to read the first two chapters. These are the questions I ask myself. How have social media platforms, and then I call those, all those individual systems that I just show, microsystem, but also the ecosystem as a whole, how have they evolved and transformed between <coughs> 2001 and 2012? So within that short time span of, of 10 or 11 years. Now, I'm using two sets of theory here. One is taken from uh, actor network theory from Bruno Latour, which some of you may be familiar with. If not, don't mind. You don't need it to actually you know, uh, follow this presentation. It's a very sort of techno-cultural approach to media and to uh, technology in general but it's very technologically minded i'll give you more examples of that a little later i felt that when you look at social media platforms you cannot do without also a socio-economic approach and perspectives on how uh, perspectives on how they evolve um, for some reason no one has ever tried to combine those two words i think those two theories are totally complementary and I've tried to build a model or design a, an analytical model that uses both of their theoretical perspectives and combined it, which I think you know, is sort of a great asset when you look at social media platforms. So that was my first sort of uh, question of curiosity. How have they transformed? It's a very open question. The second one is more geared toward finding out how these social media have carved out a, a place in your everyday social in your everyday practices you know media are not just things by themselves they become things when you appropriate them to a certain extent in your daily life that's how they become useful not just to you but to society as a whole um, so how have they become normalized and that's a term I steal from uh, Foucault from uh, Michel Foucault who used the term normalization not just to explain how things become normal in you know, your everyday life, but also how they become normative, norms. How do they become you know, norms in everyone's life? That's how we use that particular term. The term everyday practice, of course, comes from Michel uh, de Certeau, who really was you know, intent on uh, describing how people use certain practices in their everyday lives. Right, so these are the two basic questions I asked myself and tried to theorize from a particular, from a particular uh, theoretical perspective, but also try to find out more what those social media platforms do with us as users. And I could have endlessly selected and picked and chose platforms to actually analyze as microsystems because you know there were there are plenty around and and they're changing every day and that makes it a bit iffy, you know, to and edgy to actually do history when it's still evolving and things are changing by the day. So my history ends uh, in May of last year, May 2012. You know, sorry, but this old sort of uh, old-fashioned publishing needs about half a year to, you know, uh, to be processed. And then <coughs> everything, of course, changes afterwards. So now it's about a, y a year ago that I finished the research, a little longer, just before, actually just after uh, Facebook's IPO. Um, but I think what I mainly 
what I mainly tried to get at is not the exact facts of the history, but the underlying system, how it's evolving and how it will be evolving in the future. So that's what I'm trying to get at. In order to look at that, not just the microsystems, but the ecosystem as a whole, you know, an entire system, I used five particular platforms. Two SNSs, as we call them, social network services, Facebook and Twitter, and three what we call UGC platforms, user-generated content. So there's plenty of more social media sites. I have not looked at, for instance, trade and marketing sites, Amazon, a host of other platforms. I have not looked at, uh, uh, for instance, play and game sites. There's a number of you know, play sites, game sites that come into the equation. It was just undoable to do everything. So I picked these five, mostly because Facebook and Twitter very obviously are examples of you know, the biggest social network service, <coughs> highest penetration in the world, Twitter as the biggest uh, uh, microblogging service. So those examples, those microsystems were obvious. YouTube is also obvious, the biggest video sharing service, you know, with Google as its, uh, as its owner, so we have the big companies there. Flickr might not be so obvious why I selected that one as an example of a platform. Actually, the reason why I, sh why I chose it is because I consider it a failed platform. Now, you may, we may have a discussion later about <coughs> the notion of failing because I think it's, that's why I chose it. It's a platform that started out in the top 10. It was very, very popular. I was a very uh, active user on Flickr. And then it dwindled. All of a sudden, in 2008, 9, 10, it began to dwindle, and it's now like in, some in the 50s, like, you know, a place like 59 or 58. Um, why a failed platform? Well, it's interesting, but that's what Bruno Latour did with the, the Paris Metro system. He looked at a failed system, and he says, it's by looking at a failed microsystem or a failed system that you can tell what norms are how norms are implemented. So it's especially looking at failure that explains you what makes success, right? What drives success. That's why I chose Flickr. Wikipedia may also raise questions because you think, why is that a UGC platform, user-generated content? Sure, yeah, it was one of the first. And not only that, there was like, you know, it started in 2002, way before all these other platforms, but it was very much considered a community platform where people really, you know, produced content together, and it still is to some extent, although most people no longer see it as part of this particular SNS UGC framework. Um, the, more, the most important reason why I chose Wikipedia, though, is that still, <coughs> to this very date, the only <coughs> non-profit platform in this entire ecosystem, not the entire ecosystem, but out of the top 100 of platforms, there's only one, perhaps I should say two, but there's only one that is non-profit, and that's Wikipedia. The other one that I'm still hesitant about is Pirate Bay, so I'm not sure whether you would call that non-profit. That's another totally different discussion, but you know, there's a couple of, of those sort of uh, platforms out there. The rest is all commercial and, uh, uh, and monetized. So that's why I picked those five platforms. Um, then I looked at, you know, I just showed you the two research questions. How do I want to look at these platforms as single microsystems and the ecosystem as a whole. And I indicated to you that I chose very different approaches, namely Latour's socio-technological approach and Castell's, who is, you know, uh, well, basically political economy. And they're looking at those systems from very different <coughs> angles. They're not like contradictory. They're more like what I would consider complementary. And I decided that, okay, let's look at those platforms from those different angles because I think, and that's really a conviction that we could debate later on, but um, any platform now is no longer a single system that you can only look at from you know, a technological point of view or even a cultural point of view, but you also have to look at it as an economic system. There's no way you can actually look at it from one approach and just you know, really understand it and how it works. So out of the possible, <coughs> there's many other elements that I could have taken that I could have chosen in order to analyze, but I chose six. And that's a manner of sort of turning your analytical model into a consistent, consistent tool for actually looking at the same objects. Uh, I decided to choose technology, mostly interfaces of platforms, 
user and usage, users, you know, different types of users, which I will come back to in a second. Content, of course, the content of messages. And then on the political econo economy side, I use ownership because that's a really big thing and that's very typical for political economy, of course, approaches. Governance, um, which is, think about your terms of use that you have that little fee that you have to sign before you actually are allowed to get on a site that most people don't even know they sign, but they do. And they're very Im there's very <coughs> important stuff out there that most people don't even know. And business models. Now, most politi political economy um, advocates, they don't much care about governance, for instance, or they don't really look at that and hardly look at business models, but they are very much interested in ownership. I decided to choose these six elements, as I call them, and look at those microsystems very consistently from those six angles and try to see how I could come up with a consistent analysis, not just of these individual platforms, but of the ecosystem in its entirety. And then, you know, in my last chapter, I look at these, uh, these six elements at the ecosystem as a whole and see how all these platforms interact. Okay, so that was my, that was the methodology that I chose just for those of you who were interested. And if not, you can just forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't bother you much with it, so. Okay, now, more generally, the evolution of the cultural context er, the, uh, in those years between 2001 and 2012 it's very interesting to look back on, you know, those years and how um, the whole climate for, yeah, it was almost a climate change, you know, the climate that changed from what I call a culture of connectedness into a culture of connectivity. And that has become the title of my book. What do I mean by, you know, that culture change? It's really in the early years, let's say until around 06, 07, but by 08, we have definitely had that turning point. Um, we were still, you know, everyone was really enthusiastic. There, were, there was talk about participatory culture, human connections, and more in that in the second part of this uh, decade, uh, you know, s let's say 2008 to 12 and, and now, there's a lot more emphasis on connectivity. And by connectivity, I'm going to explain that in the rest of my talk, I mostly mean algorithmic connections through platforms. Now, I'll come back to that, so in just a little while. What I also realized in that, looking back on that cultural evolution in this decade, I realized there's a gradual formalization, normalization, and commercialization of social activities. Basically, what happened in that era is that <coughs> off offline social life, sociality, as we call it, became increasingly uh, formalized. Everything that you, you know, in every situation in which you connect now, it's mostly online for <laughs> others there to see. It became algorithmically steered or directed and it became uh, a lot more formal. You know, we think it's still a very informal way of interacting when we go on Facebook or on Twitter. But in fact, what it's going on is that it is a very formal context in which we interact. And it's increasingly becoming more formal as, you know, as we speak because it's, um, it's not ephemeral, it stays there, it's permanent, and it's ins you know, there's an inscription of that formal social activity that you cannot erase. Even if you're a 16 year old and you think that will all be erased when you grow up, well, hey, sorry, you know, it's going to be there probably forever. The commercialization I will get to in a little while, but you know, all kinds of offline social terms like friending and sharing and liking, those have all become infiltrated or permeated by algorithmic notions. And it's not that we just, you know, change those notions from offline notions to online, but sometimes it's the other way around that those online notions of liking came to sort of define what offline social relations, how they worked and what they looked at, you know, they were looking, uh, how they will look like, they look like, this like term comes back all the time. So, um, so I will get back to these mechanisms and I will show you a, an example of uh, the example of Facebook in a little while. When I was thinking about just one clear symbol of what I mean by connectedness and connectivity, I came up with this symbol for connectedness. People, you know, just making connections, right? Very simple. This is 
what I would call connectivity. Now, just, you know, ideally, but I, I stole the picture, so I didn't make them up myself. I, I'm, not the very, I'm not very good at drawing, but ideally I would have made, turned these into a circle, but that, you know, didn't work. What I'm getting at when I talk about connectivity, it's really the gray lines that you see in this picture. Of course, people still do like, you know, a lot of social activities, you know, but they no longer go unmediated. They're mediated, each of these social activities are mediated by these microsystem. And these microsystems together form an ecosystem, whereas all these individuals together form a social system, right? A system of social activity. So what I'm interested in basically is in this scheme is the gray lines, connecting people to platforms, platforms to platforms, platforms to people, and people to people, true platforms, right? So that's sort of the gray lines I'm interested in. I just talked about that cultural transformation between 2002 and 12, and there's two symbols, I think, that I take from 06 and 2010. In 2006, we had you as person of the year. You probably, you're all old enough to remember that, except for little Emma. And she's talking to us now that she doesn't remember, but she will in 18 years. Um, 2006, this was the, you know, the culture of uh, uh, participatory culture, the celebration of you as the ideal and sort of utopian user. It was a story about community <coughs> and collaboration, about the many resting power from the few, helping one another how that will not only change the world, but also change the world, the way the world changes. Now, this is an interesting quote because you saw, later on, you, we have seen this quote repeated and in, in you know, various manifestations, but in many, many ways. Um, just recently with you know, the revolutions in the Middle East, for instance, you saw this type of technological utopianism come back like all the available tools <laughs> that can help change the world to make it a better place. You know, more democracy, more openness, equal power, those were the terms that, we all, that were all used. Four years later, who was the person of the year? It's the grand master of connectivity, and that's Mark Zuckerberg. Now, I'm interested in looking at the kind of rhetoric that Mark Zuckerberg was using to promote connectedness, but what he meant really was connectivity. So, and this deliberate mixing up of connectedness and connectivity, I think, is really a great, great master move. And he did that by using terms like, you know, privacy is an evolving norm. Now, I don't think privacy is the evolving norm. Well, sure, but that's the consequence of sharing becoming the norm, right? Sharing is something that, you know, he, he uh, promoted as that's something we all need to do. But by sharing, he mostly meant sharing with third parties. So sharing becoming the norm is the, uh, actually the consequence of sharing as a norm is that privacy becomes an evolving norm. Every app is going to be social. Interestingly, um, what he means by social, making everything social was one of his slogans. What he meant was really making <coughs> the social technological, making the social algorithmic, and making the social monetizable. That is really what uh, Mark Zuckerberg was professing. He was totally right. I mean, he, that's really what it was, but he, he kept w using and still using the word social as where he means technological and monetizable. So I just want you to, to be aware of the, that type of rhetoric. So he borrows the rhetoric of connectedness to actually you know, making the world more transparent and connected. I think the latest novel by Dave Eggers, which I haven't read yet, but I've read an ad excerpt, is all about transparency and making the world connected, more transparent, more open. So that's an interesting thing to uh, remember. Okay, I <coughs> promised you to give you one example, and that's the only microsystem I will actually uh, explain to explore for you today, and the rest, all of the other microsystems are explored in the book. But then, you know, other, if I would do everything, I would be here at you know, still at eight o'clock tonight. So Facebook and that word sharing, how this, did that word sharing, the norm for sharing, how did that become normative? Any one of you who were on Facebook in 2004? Anyone in this room? Okay, 
All right, at least five people. Now, I'm curious to find out if you still remember this interface. <laughs> you do? That was the Facebook interface right after it started in 2004. Now, what occurs to you? You now have <laughs> your, you know, in the back of your mind, you have your, the, the latest uh, uh, Facebook interface, but what do you see when you look at this interface? What occurs to you? What do you think is remarkable? No ads. It's right. Okay. There's. Sorry. No timeline. Right. It's like a directory, right? Anything else? It's founded on this idea of being affiliated with the college. Right. How can you see that? How do you notice? Status, alumnus, concentration. Very important. Right. It, this is the Harvest, Harvard, Fa it's still the Facebook, you see that? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still connected, very much embedded in the Harvard College campus environment, which is very important to notice because uh, the offline situation was sort of di giving directions how to read the online, uh, you know, social engine. So you actually provided all this information. There were nobody said there's no like button there, right? Yeah. There are no automated buttons whatsoever. There's no news feed, there's no like button, there's no, you know, any of the automated features that we have on Facebook now. All the information you see there is information that you provided for as a user. You know, you gave it basically to Facebook. There's a lot of information <coughs> now that you don't actually give. Uh, the most controversial feature here was probably relationship status. If you have watched the social network, the movie, you know that you know half that movie is about that you know the that feature and how much controversy it uh, elicited. Hey, when we get to the like button, you know it's like <coughs> a different story altogether. Okay, so this was really you know only just one small picture. This was timeline, and you know this is not even the latest overhaul. But I chose this one because it's sort of it's sort of kind of similar to. Uh, the interface that I've used for an article. Well, what occurs to you now compared to the 2004 one? What's the biggest difference? Well, everything, but what is the biggest <laughs> difference? What is the biggest difference? Way more interactive. Well, what do you call more interactive? More, you're just connecting faster with people. Sure, so how come? Right, which is automated, right? Sorry? Right, yeah, so lots of pictures which are, you know, turned into uh, clicking symbols. Look at the ads. Ha, huh. as a matter of fact, there's, I think, you know, there's still Stanford alumni, but that's more a coincidence than it refers to the college environment that we were talking about. Because here, of course, <coughs> Facebook had gone global for, you know, quite a while. So now it's the global context that we're looking into. Uh, there's like buttons. There's all kinds of uh, automated buttons, status, photo, you know, place. There's geostamps and timestamps, which are automated buttons. Um, many pictures and large pictures. It's more like a magazine that you're looking at than, than it's like a profile that you just called it a profile. And then, of course, naturally the timeline, which basically standardizes uh, all of Facebook profiles. Not just because, you know, you like to get connected with people who are in your age group or in your uh, demographic status or uh, whatever, but this is for advertisers, of course. The more standardized a profile is, the more connectivity you generate and you can actually uh, provide for your third party accessors. So the reason for timeline to be standardized is really, you know, advertising and uh, data generation. The more standardized that is, the easier it is for uh, Facebook to sell the data to third parties. Okay, so to summarize here, you know, we go from a social network in a college campus to a global network, user generated data or provided data by users to automate it, no ads to personalized ads. Uh, the user still controlled the data in the early Facebook environment, and now the platform controls the data. And of course, this we haven't said, but uh, the defaults in that previous profile were still on <coughs> private. When Facebook changed to timeline, you had to consent that all your information was going to be reset to public in order to make 
things uh, private, you had to reset it manually. Each and every one of your posts needed to be reset. That was a very smart move because 80% of the people really don't care or they don't know how to reset their profile to private. So this was a really interesting you know, move by Facebook and how they controlled that. Okay, so these were just you know, two features of the six that elements that I mentioned. Let's talk a little bit about the users. I can't go into detail, but I just picked a few milestones. And I just explained to you that, you know, or I, perhaps I didn't mention it, but Facebook from 2004 to 12 went <coughs> from a few thousand uh, users to 1.2 billion users, right? So that's a huge increase. Now, you may think that all of these users have been compliant. You know, they just used Facebook as <coughs> Facebook wants us to use the platform. Well, they were not, but you may not have heard anything about how Facebook uh, users have resisted, have sort of opposed what uh, the platform did in terms of their using uh, their user uh, friendliness. And there was quite a bit of uh, protest, you know, against all the changes that Facebook has made over the years. But interestingly, most of those protests were in 2007 and 2008, when Facebook was still relatively small and you know, 50,000 users, for instance, protested Beacon, which, do some of you remember Beacon, the first features? Yeah, it was a very, you know, well-described feature that was sort of the pre-like function, but it sort of, with, uh, Facebook had a contract with 40 companies, including the New York Times and some other companies, TripAdvisor, some others, um, that would show uh, not only you, but also your friends where you were shopping or what you had bought. So, you know, with aft every single feature af uh, that Facebook implemented afterwards was a lot more controversial than Beacon. But Beacon was the first thing they actually tried to implement, and that caused a lot of outcry. Facebook users didn't like that. They sort of, you know, that was their platform. They were the users, and they owned that content. And Facebook, you know, was not supposed to interfere by putting ads there. Advertiser advertisements were still very sort of, you know, you didn't really do that in SMS environments. Later on, you know, many, many, uh, and I look at users who are resistant because it's like, you know, you, use a, you look at failed platforms because you try to see the norm and you, use that, you look at resisting users because that tells you how people normally use the platform, right? So you look at how they do not want or do not like the changes uh, in order to see how that norm changes. So that's what I decided to look at, users that did not like those changes. And I found a lot of protests, but of course, you know, it sparked even the timeline feature, for, sparked many protests and uh, the like button, for instance, sparked incredible uh, resistance, but it was nothing in the face of those compliant users that were growing into, you know, the masses that Facebook serves now. I will not go to each and any one of those features, but Facebook changed its governance. You know, very, uh, it was basically by governments, I'm looking at the terms of use. The only consistency in Facebook's terms of use is that it changes every day, almost, that you cannot keep up with that little V that you know you, right? And they, you know, they can do that. They can change it without notifying the users. They make all these changes. Now, there have been several lawsuits for in terms of, you know, the privacy um, uh, regulations that Facebook has on its site. Um, and they have been battled in court, they have been battled outside court, in user groups and, you know, in various settlements. Facebook settled very quickly last year, just before the IPO in 2012, and that was over the like button. Um, so they have become very interested, you know, in sort of struggling at that boundary. Basically, Facebook pushes the norms of sharing three steps forward at a time, and then one backward because you know users protest or react or there's a lawsuit or whatever. But that's what's happening every time, and that's how the norms for sharing, or what I was just calling, you know, the normalization of sharing, is sort of pushing the privacy norm. So it's not privacy uh, lawyers out there that are actually changing, you know, the legal stuff. They're not like lawyers who are doing that. The norm, and that's really what Foucault is arguing, the norm is much stronger than the law. The law basically follows what people, you know, find normal in their normal life. 
And in 2012, we are much more used to sharing, sharing online information than we were in 2007. If you would compare those two cultures, it's really, really different. We have become very accustomed to sharing information online, whether you like it or not. I mean, that's, you know, this is how norms are being pushed. Facebook's ownership. Now, it started out as a campus network and it basically expanded very rapidly. What you may not know is that um, uh, other companies bought stakes in Facebook way before, you know, it's uh, IPO, of course. If it, uh, Microsoft, for instance, owns 5% of Facebook shares. So before the IPO, Microsoft was already deeply embedded in, uh, uh, in Facebook. And partnerships and deals, you know, are very much part of what Facebook's ownership is all about. Zynga, Instagram, <coughs> Axiom. Axiom is a big data company. There are now three or four of the biggest data companies in the United States that collaborate very closely with Facebook, which means they're third parties that can actually get access to uh, Facebook's uh, 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 content. So, working all the way up to the IPO, I will get back to the IPO a little later since uh, I don't want to dwell too long on the ownership. Its business model is interesting. Um, it started out as a very, very simple, <coughs> basically non-business model because Facebook wasn't making any money till, you know, basically I think 2010 or 11. So there was no uh, uh, business model at all or not a working one at least. Um, advertisers came in, in around 2007, very sparsely initially and then, you know, more uh, banner ads, you know, all types of different advertisement. But soon there came a lot of other uh, types of, you know, in, uh, of business models that Facebook is now, uh, uh, has now on the line, which is they, of course, now sell data to uh, other companies, especially data companies. There's internet providers they work with, app developers that they make money off, and, of course, there's partnerships, not only through Microsoft and Zynga. And since 2012, there's the relationship with the shareholders, since now, of course, uh, and Twitter is going the same way. You see almost the same patterns in ownership with Twitter. Also, true partnerships, true, uh, you know, uh, and next year or this year even going for an IPO. That IPO was very interesting. You know, in on the on its way to the IPO, Facebook really battled very hard, not so much for. Um, uh, its users, you know, to get hold of its users, but, you know, they've ha they already had like almost a billion users, so, but they were especially appealing to their shareholders. That was now the new thing that they wanted to involve in that rhetoric of sharing, you know, almost literally it became shareholders. They wanted, those are the new uh, people who share, share everything with you. So I want to show you a little excerpt from a video that uh, was made by Facebook and that sh ex well, explains a little bit about how Facebook is using the, rec the rhetoric of connectedness in order to sell that pitch of connectivity, of, you know, sharing. So I want you to listen to it and l tell me what you know. So tell me what you see in, the, in using this rhetoric. Let me see if the, uh, I hope the sound works now, it just did. Um, I would do that. So ads, you know, have always been this really important part of what we do because we want to keep Facebook free for everyone. As Mark and Chris described, at Facebook we have a broad mission. We want to make the world more open and connected. People on Facebook connect to businesses just as they connect to other people. I take my kids to the Woodside Bakery for pancakes. I track my runs with Nike Fuel Band. I shop at J.Crew. On Facebook, marketers can leverage the power of these connections to build their businesses, to find customers, to engage in ongoing conversations. Messages on Facebook spread not just from business to consumer, but more importantly, from friend to friend. At Ben & Jerry's, we're not just a company, we really are a friend to people. We really want to have a holistic relationship with our community, with our consumers about values, about free ice cream. So having a platform where we can actually engage in a large scale conversation, get feedback, that's what's so powerful about Facebook. So the Ben & Jerry's Facebook page is a 
revolving and it has this big beautiful picture on top and down the side it has the different dates of our 35 year history. Having other people talk about Ben and Jerry's is really at the core of the Ben and Jerry strategy. Our 3.4 million fans have 244 million friends out there. The scale of that community is mind-boggling. That's how we engage a lot of people. You can really reach your consumers in a lot of different touch points. On their mobile phone, in their news feed. It also uh, puts it into social context. So you can see your friends, if they've engaged with it, you can comment on it, you can like it, and you can share it. This is something that we would never be able to do if it wasn't for Facebook. We have been able to measure the impact of our Facebook page uh, by putting it into a marketing mix analysis. For every $1 we spent on Facebook, it returned $3 in incremental sales. The global advertising market is huge. Almost 600... Okay, let's stop it here. <laughs> What occurred to you in terms of the rhetoric of connectedness? Do I have to explain? You know, you're no longer consumers, of course. You don't eat, go buy an ice cream at Ben and Jerry's. No, you're part of their friending, sharing club. And, you know, you like the product and you share in enjoying that product, right? So it's almost like a gospel of sharing. I call this the gospel of sharing. It's almost a religious use of the notion of sharing, not exactly as this in the meaning of soci sociality as we used to offline but now this online notion of sharing which is you know connectivity they use it in one and the same breath is it's selling yeah. so for me now going to facebook is really like i'm going to a big tupperware party <laughs> i don't know if you still are you know too young to remember that but when emma grows up she you know she probably has someone has to explain to her what tupperware parties are or were in the 1970s that's how I feel when I'm on Facebook. I feel, okay, is this a friend or a customer? I invented a new term for that, and that's frustumer. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not really sure if I'm if considered a friend or a customer. So, you know, <coughs> each time I go on Facebook, I think, okay, what am I? Basically, these are, to sum up, these are the ex what I call the expansive definitions of sharing. Sharing information with friends, which, you know, we sort of pitched as producers with an S, have now become, you know, sharing information with late, latent friends. The people you may know button is like, okay, you don't even know these people, but we know that you want to know these people, yeah. right? I mean, that's whom you want to share with. It's literally a projection of sharing onto an algorithmically selected uh, number of people who want to share that with you. And, pe and Facebook knows, you don't, but Facebook knows. Um, sharing as a social activity, which is pretty much, you know, and I'm not saying that Facebook is no longer doing these things. The interesting thing is that it's still all of these things. You know, it's still like a great tool for connecting with people. It's still a great tool for making connections, for connectedness. The thing is, you know, it has sort of taken on this meaning in one and the same breath. And that's what I want to point out. So now it's mostly that algorithmic activity is mostly in the owner's interest. And sociality as an informal space, which used to be like the private environment of peers and intimate connections, very, what we used to call social capital, has now become basically, literally, very literally, the number of friends you had, have on Twitter has become your economic capital, not just your social capital. It's, it is economic. You know? so, so that, I think, is like the biggest um, uh, transition. Um, we were just talking about norms, and I found a few cartoons from 2008 and 9. And <coughs> when we look at those, it's interesting that we used to laugh about those cartoons. They're pretty obvious right now, I think, yeah. you know? And that's the funny thing about it, that is that they're no longer funny. Uh, I mean, you know, they can make you laugh, but they no longer do. So we no longer you look at your resumes. I found a statistics that uh, I'm not sure if it's only the United States or uh, uh, that I found this one in Australia, but employers, before they decide whom they're going to uh, uh, see for an interview, they look for 90% of them look at your Facebook page, even more so than looking at, for instance, your LinkedIn page, which is supposed to be your professional profile, uh, because they find a lot more personal stuff on Facebook and you know they, they prefer that over going to LinkedIn. 
So it is pretty much the norm right now to look at uh, Facebook before you go to resumes, right? So nothing to laugh about. And that was a real interesting cartoon in 2008 when that, uh, in, in uh, um, the, I just told you the uh, relationship status on Facebook was like this feature that was sort of controversial. So this made people laugh. Now, some people may not even realize why this would be funny. Interestingly, I just found two weeks ago this cartoon in the New Yorker, and I thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> um, for a particular reason, you know, oh, there's really nothing wrong with our marriage, you know, that social relationship <coughs> is like, you know, social, we'll just figure out a way to monetize it. Now, monetizing by itself has become, I think, the great thing to do to the social. I think the social as we view it today, and I pick signs up, you know, every, I've only been here since late August, but I've seen numerous examples of this. For instance, a friend told me that, uh, well, no, let's, it's what I saw on the news, just on the news hour, la I think it was this week or last week, uh, there was this item on a summer program in New York City schools that asked uh, children, like, what is it, 7th uh, or 8th grade, what are they, 14, 15 years old, for a summer program to go out and in New York City find social situations that they could monetize. I thought, oh gosh. So they had to come back with a business model for a, to improve social life in New York City. And I was just astounded. I thought, this is what you know, kids are asked to, not to make better, improve you know, life, social life in New York, but to go out there, improve social life in New York and monetize. They had to come back with a business model. So I thought this cartoon was really right on target. Um, okay, um, I asked two questions in the beginning, you know, the two questions that I framed, but basically what I wanna come back to is that ecosystem of uh, various, you know, consisting of all those microsystems. And of course I'm interested in not so much those ecosystems as, uh, you know, by themselves, but as a system that is transforming our sociality as a whole. So this was basically the, the last question I asked in the book. What are the implications of transforming microsystems for that larger system of connective media, as I prefer to call social media, because social now to me is sort of a contrived term. It's like has all these connotations, so I prefer to use connective media. Now, when I was looking at those, you know, at those same six elements, but then looking at the system as a whole, I realized that sociality now is coded by proprietary algorithms. And each of these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they have their own idiosyncratic algorithms, but as a system, they really sort of reinforce each other's, those algorithms, you know, they're not, they're very complementary and sort of based on the same principles, like the popularity principle, for instance, you know, both uh, Twitter, for instance, they're not like every user is not the same for them, but they bump up uh, users as they are more, you know, trustworthy or val valuable to the network itself. So they all have their own mechanisms, um, but they are very similar to some extent. They work from the same uh, uh, from the same premises. So mostly they're proprietary and invisible. You know, you can't really get to the you know, the, the, uh, the, what the algorithms actually do. They also, all these platforms have niches or they sort of cover niches of sociality that are monopolized now by a few powerfully, a powerful vertically integrated change. That's a, just a word for, you know, big companies that are now increasingly dominating that landscape. GAFA stands for Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. And they have sort of, developed into sort of platform uh, portal companies where you go on Google, for instance, let's say you go on YouTube, and Google, of, cor of course, now owns a whole vertical change of platforms that link you from play and game sites to music to if you want to buy, you buy into the, of course, the Google ad system uh, that, you know, has the, the ad fun function. You go through uh, pay, uh, the Google Pay system, uh, there's a complete, you know, line of integrated, vertical, in vertically integrated uh, platforms that if you stay within the Google ecosystem, you're fine. If you want to move out, you have to sort of, you know, that's another thing. I described that in the last chapter of my book. 
Um, I never went into hardware in this book. I made, you know, they had to make this restriction because the book would have been three times as long as it is now. But hardware is also a very important part of that ecosystem. I sort of regret now that I didn't do it, but the book wouldn't have been finished by now. So that was a choice yeah. I made. So, and it changes every day. It's even harder to trace hardware changes and transformations than the uh, software changes I, s I stick to. Um, they're also connected to what I've come to call a nirvana of interoperability. That's not my term. It's used by uh, one of the platform owners. And what I mean is that a lot of these systems, terms of use, are now interrelated and integrated. Uh, Google, just a year and a half ago, integrated all of its user systems. Now when you log into Google, into YouTube or whatever, you're using one and the <coughs> same terms of use. Okay, that didn't used to be that way. So increasingly we're looking at um, a few big players in a large field that is dominated by those players who define the portals to you know that larger ecosystem because um, uh, Facebook is cooperating or has partnerships with many many you know single microsystems out there and they all get their traffic much of the traffic through uh, face through uh, Facebook in this case. And then I get to this last point. That whole ecosystem is now thoroughly commercial. I already pointed it out to you of the one top 100, only one is really nonprofit, and that's Wikipedia. Now, and even that is questionable because in my fifth chapter in the book, I explain how Wikipedia, I think it's, I love Wikipedia. It's one of the greatest systems, and I'm a big Wikipedia fan. But how does Wikipedia get most of its traffic? Actually, 60% of its traffic comes through Google. Google is also one of the biggest uh, funders of the Wikipedia Foundation, which is fine. I mean, I have nothing against that, but it's hard, very difficult to really call uh, Wikipedia a complete nonprofit. It just, it's impossible, I think, to operate as a, you know, as a nonprofit system within that whole ecosystem of uh, commercially operating platforms. We can <coughs> discuss that later, but these are just the observations that I made from looking at the ecosystem as an entire system. Now, I'll get to the end of my uh, uh, talk. I sort of, you know, want to conclude on a few notions that connectivity is not so much a term that I invented that I thought was, you know, nice of sort of fitted well into that history. I think it has become almost an ideology for uh, you know, that uh, sort of a normative uh, idea of sharing, of monetizing, of things that, you know, the social that you need to make. I hear now 15-year-old kids saying that they, they want to, you know, uh, they want to uh, invent the next uh, big Facebook and invent, like, not just a way to uh, make things, you know, work better, make sociality work better, but to monetize the social. And that's really a big change, I think, into uh, that system. Um, I think all platforms are now staked in a common connective media logic, and that's one of the things I want to elaborate upon in the next project, where I look at how media logic is uh, evolving and how it turns into a, a, a logic that really penetrates a lot of social fields, especially public institutions, which is my last point here. Uh, a lot, it affects the nature of a lot of public spaces. Uh, we just talked about this over lunch. For instance, education, where you see uh, massive open online courses coming in, using that same uh, logic underlying, you know, Facebook and uh, Silicon Valley companies. So that I think is um, ma turning it into the more the ideological level. I think is is quite important here. Social media, once again are very, very empowering platform for users. I'm not discrediting that, you know, use of social media to any extent. I'm not, I think they're one of the greatest inventions since, the, since sliced bread. But they also have another side, and that's something I want to point out. They're two sides of the same coin. And when you buy into that system, it automatically becomes part of, you know, your experience of sociality. It's not something you can, you know, do without. You cannot just not look at that. So that's part of a project that I'm working <coughs> on uh, for the next two years or so. Um, I would be happy to debate any of these issues with you, but, you know, a couple of these things that really, um, that I pick up on in the last chapter are 
how are these platforms staked in the normative changes, not just sharing, but you know, there are all kinds of terms out there, liking and following and uh, you know, friending, and uh, that are not simply affecting legal definitions, for instance, privacy, but really affect social boundaries. You know, what we decide that becomes public or private or corporate or should, you know, how much of our space, our social space, should really be public or should we keep private? There's not much discussion about that because, but underlying, you know, there's a lot of underlying these platforms, there's mechanisms that define that for you. So I would like to bring that out in the open. And then of course, all the technologies and the business models that are sort of hidden under the hood in many of these platforms, you can, you, you know, I just showed you the Facebook interfaces and I do a lot of sort of interface analysis, but it's really difficult to go to the back end of these technologies and really see what's happening underneath. They're, well, they're proprietary secrets and rightly so because that's the way that, you know, businesses make their money. So obviously we can't get to that, but it's very important in terms of how that defines how <coughs> we live, how we, how we experience our, the social space that we live in. So these are questions that I, you know, throw out for you, like, what is that? How do we know about them? How should we know? How should, do we know, need to know more about that? Do you know enough about how these mechanisms work? Those are, they're just open questions. So I will leave it at this, since there probably are some questions and I would like to share, you know, more information with you, but I would like to do that offline rather than online later on. Please. Uh, but the cause and effect is so Because um, there is a sort of story here, right? But the story is that the uh, architecture of, of the platform architecture creates social conventions and commercial interests create social, uh, create architecture. And the other way around. Well, it's, uh, well the, the platform conventions are what makes the social conventions, right? And, but then yeah. there's economic interests that shape the architecture. Right? Yeah. So it's it's the mutual shaping. So, right, but there is a sort of, and it's a really appealing story, right, because we, it's, it's appealing to us too, because we see the sort of commercial interest and we're, we're angry at it and we'd like to change it and we feel we can't. Um, we also sort of send, we tend to say things like, well, people used to be different now, they're, you know, now because of those damn problems. And, that's actually you know, not how I... No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but okay. I'm saying it's going to be appealing to yeah. them for that reason. But uh, the, I'm also kind of thinking about the, the, the other, and I can't remember the name of this great study about phones, you know, mystery of phones and how it was actually, in, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering the author, but uh, the... Uh, that phones, that, like uh, when, when AT&T first started uh, marketing phones, it was very much a business right. uh, transaction, and it was a kind of users kept rebelling, and so AT&T had to change its structure and platform and, and monetary kind of model to fit how people actually wanted to use the technology. Yeah. And so I'm, I, those are kind of the two tensions that I'm seeing, right. and I understand that you are accounting for both of them, but. I, I want to hear you talk more about, about that tension and why it's not the other way around. Yeah. That is very how good people question. use it. Yeah. Um, I pointed out in the beginning that I used one platform to show for, in, in terms of failure, which yes. is the mm -hmm. approach to the platform failure. And now I bring it up because you make it very relevant. Um, there's no reason why I did not talk about it, except for that the talk would become too long. But, um, it's a very interesting platform, and I think it's one of the more important chapters in the book because it shows that <coughs> uh, not everything works as planned. And this is not like a deliberate uh, mechanism that you know, evolves from techn technological use. And that's why I'm calling it mutual shaping of uh, technology and sociality. Um, in that platform, Flickr, what you see is that users, I showed you some resistant users, you know, in, in Facebook. Well, in uh, the play the Flickr context, they were very successful, and they were a lot more <coughs> powerful in terms of having Facebook, which became uh, owned by, by Yahoo, by the way, in 2005, even earlier than when uh, uh, Google bought uh, YouTube. Um, they became very powerful, and they didn't want the platform to change, and they were very much a community in sort of resisting the, uh, uh, the Yahoo powers to change their platform. So, and I looked at that interesting history and sort of figured out what were the points of resistance that I could pinpoint. And there I found sort of the opposite of the Facebook story, 
okay, so those users really use a, a particular interest in their platform to steer the platform in a direction that uh, the manager and the owners didn't want them to go, but it went there nevertheless. The result, of course, being that they ended up like in place 58 of the top rank, and Yahoo doesn't like that. So they basically disregard Flickr now as a val one of their valuable flagship platforms, um, which the users find wonderful. They don't care, mm -hmm. you know, they just say, well, fine, the parent company, they don't like us, but we like our platform. So there's two different stories here, and I, I very much value to point out both of these, you know, these stories, because they, they are really related. So. Um, I, I really, really enjoyed this very, very much. Um, and the first thing that Tasha said about the historical sweep, you know, that's something I'm a little stuck on, and I guess I'm curious to hear what you think of, of the idea that if we draw the contrast between what they're calling connectedness and connectivity too strongly, we may, we perhaps, I, might, I would suggest, miss a deeper historical yeah. uh, thread here, right? There, there is a, a liberal commitment that is not reducible to the money interest, I would say, in the crowd, right. in against experts, against curation, right? Such that the connectedness and the connectivity and its monetization are, in fact, not so much in tension with each other. Yeah. You know, I agree with you that there's a, a media logic in place, and you know, I, I call it what I call it, what you call it, but uh, I think until we, we confront the fact that it's a, it's a deep, shall we say, liberal set of commitments that unite, in fact, those two sides yeah. of it, I, I don't think we get the whole historical sweep. Yeah. No, you're actually quite right. It, it is this flip side thing. That's why I pointed out to the one who's last slide. It is really like, both empowering and you know, uh, disempowering. You have to see those things at the same time. And it's a little provocative, but I sort of disconnected to put them, you know, as, because I want people to see what's happening. I wanted to use it, and that's what I pointed out in the beginning, as an analytical tool, rather than a historical overview. That's not how I meant it to be. That's why I call it a critical history and not a history of social media. I do not believe that this is the history from point A to A to B. I want it to be an analytical <coughs> tool where I can make people, where, where I force people more or less to look at those elements from both sides. And that's why I use sometimes to use how users are empowered, like in the Flickr chapter, and sometimes in the Facebook chapter, like how they were disempowered, right? But we have to look at both sides of the point to see this, how they're totally, you know, sort of can I, you mind if I follow up? Because, you know, because Foucault, you know, appears very early on here, right? And I think I wonder if he wouldn't say, you know, that empowering that we see is its own form of disciplinary control. Sure. Right. So I, again, the, the language can get in our way if, if we if we want connectedness. If it starts to look like something like a life world in the Habermasian sense, but yet it's still mediated by these architectures, which are. are governed and, and set up according to a particular logic, I wonder if that obscures uh, the way in which maybe that really isn't the life world. We'd like to think there's the part of Facebook which is not monetized and that's, that has somehow a, a, a glow around it. <coughs> but there are maybe deeper currents, socially speaking, at, that yeah. are at stake. I, I, think, I find your question interesting because it's precisely how that was that I have come back to mm -hmm. after writing this book. And now that I'm thinking about you know, the public space and what it means, I find myself going back to Habermas. And even though Lisa, you know, Lisa is using public space, of course, as a public sphere, in this, in this case, as a very idealistic notion, um, which is you know, totally not uncalled for, or you know, it's not, no longer applicable, it's not viable, it's not, perhaps not even useful as a theoretical concept. And still, I think it's important, and then I come back to your liberal, uh, uh, perspective, to have that perspective of how, in what way we want that public space to transform into. Mm -hmm. And that's how I try to use it now. So actually what you're pointing out is the point that I'm for you know, the next study. So yeah. it's sort of the flip side of what I have been doing is looking at the future to look at, okay, how do we want to sort of shape our public spaces? And how do, do we want to live with this logic? Do we want to use it in a particular way? Is it used against in our notion of public space? So that's more, I'm trying to now sort of venture into um, uh, the 
infrastructure and how that infrastructure and especially notions of space help us get you know other ideas about how we and that's very normative. That's why mm -hmm. how would you like to see your public space to be transformed? That's why I'm looking into you know education or public television, which is you know was already a very small minor space here, but in Europe it's still 50% of all television is public television. And I can see it changing, you know, almost by the year. I see it changing into a different kind of space. And that's because of a lot of platforms that are imposing the logic onto that space that we decided 50 years ago that would be a public, you know, tax-funded place where we could have public discussions. So it's really the direction that I'm trying to look into now. Sure, please. I have sort of two questions. One is about your um, connectedness to connectivity um, theory. I'm wondering if you have any kind of continuum or anything like you theorize it in that sort of a way, because it seems like you're theorizing Facebook as being, you know, sort of our connectivity end, where you mentioned only talked about Wikipedia briefly, but it seems, I think, that you would attribute that more to the kind of connectedness ideals. So I'm sort of wondering about that, and I'm also wondering about the ways that in different <coughs> contexts, mm -hmm the contexts, maybe historical contexts, which I'm, well, you kind of address that, but it may, it may be thinking more about uh, geographical context if these different platforms function differently in terms of the, that right. tension of connectedness yeah. and connectivity. Let me start with your latter question, and then we'll get to the first okay. this stops, this stops in the, the first question. Um, about uh, local or more national, other national networks, I'm very interested in, in, in those kind of networks that have a lot of national networks, and I've explained it over lunch. Uh, for instance, in, in Brazil and in Holland, you know, we have a huge national network in Dutch, which was called Ives. It took a big hit in 2011 when Facebook became the most dominant one, and within months it sort of disappeared. And that was a very strong driven by also by language, by the language, but by a national cultural uh, sort of community type of, of platform. Brazil had you saw the same thing. Um, what is interesting though, and now I get to your first question, is that while we're seeing these changes in Facebook, you know, that are more towards connectivity and the development of connectivity, we also see a reaction, we see a response from the market to those uh, connectivity drives. I have seen lately, as of late, a number of interesting alternative networks, and I somehow made a list of those, uh, because I can't remember all their fancy names, but let me just give you a few. Uh, App.net, uh, Maria, which was the backbone of the Spanish movement, mm -hmm. uh, Diaspora, which is sort of, you know, also uh, decreased just recently, Crabgrass, Timbal, Nosebra, Piyama, and Academia.org, mm -hmm. which are alternative uh, uh, social network <coughs> services. And interestingly, they become part of that same ecosystem. And I think this is like the counter force. It's like, you know, when people get tired of one network, net network, they find ways to uh, empower themselves to other networks. So, in a sense, this ecosystem idea, of course, also works to, um, well, to empower people and to... The only thing is, and that's why I'm a little hesitant about, you know, I love just pointing out these networks. I love going and you know, promoting them. The thing is, they're so small in the face of those huge, you know, the Twitters and the Facebooks and the YouTubes and the Googles that I wonder how much, how, how long they can survive in that ecosystem. And that's really a, a matter of how popular they can become. <coughs> um, so, I'm not sure. And you know, in one way I'm looking at history, and in another, I'm really hesitant to use it at, as, a, as what I'm saying, I'm, this is not a historical model. It's an explanatory tool to find ways to, um, to be critical and to analyze it not just historically but in its context. And that context is both you know national and global. The thing is with these large networks, they are so global, it's very hard to be either national or local or I see it happening, you know, with local networks all over Europe in those languages. It's only the Chinese and the Russian um, big networks that can survive in that context because they're big enough or they have so much censorship that it should help them to, you know, become big or stay big that they're maintained as such. So, so that's, you know, that, that's really my, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. So 
you're saying the term that I was sort of waiting here uh, to talk about is the security space and its role in this right. development of social networking because social networks, I mean, you begin with 2001 and, you know, that's not an accident because I think after 9-11, the, the, the need to uh, find ways <coughs> to mine data and to track with people is, is clearly connected with the proliferation of social networks. I'm not, this is not a paranoid cause theory saying that the state has, you know, done it, but, but they're not unrelated. And one of the events that actually happened after you finished your research right, was the Snowden revelations about the NSA. So 9-11 and Snowden kind of bookend this period that you're talking about. So where do you see the security you know, state in this, you know, you do the business or the corporate and you do the, the social and technical, but yeah. where is the state? I, you know, if I were still writing the book, this would have certainly become the end point because that would have been obvious. I finished it last year though, so, uh, so I couldn't get it anymore. You're absolutely right. Um, I make no use of, well, I, I'm not into surveillance in this book, you know, the way that data are used here is mostly for uh, advertising for commercial reasons, right? Now, to make up for that, I fin just finished an article that was accepted by Surveillance and Society because I have <laughs> brought in exactly this angle, which I think is really lacking in this book, for reasons of human selection. I left out so many angles. This, uh, there's a deliberate reason, though. I think when, once you bring in the surveillance angle from the state, it's, I find that to be a particular audience that wants to have everything into that particular angle. And I just didn't want it to go in that direction. So that was basically practical. But I'm sure that if the Snowden affair had happened like when I was still writing the book, I would have ended up. Right. And the other term, which is one that uh, many of my colleagues like to bring in, is capital. And capital becomes a way to actually connect them to the security state and right. to yeah. this, the commercially advertising and so forth. And, right. and so, you know, I think that these, I think there are really interesting you know, connections. Yeah. And if, you, if the next book is working on public, so, public space, it seems to me that that, I'd be interested to see yeah. you talk more about Yeah, and that's what, once again, when Habermas comes in, because he really identifies state on the one hand, state power, and public power as you know, two different things. And uh, private power, for instance, he identifies as both intimate, intimate, the intimate social and uh, 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 the commerce, corporate space. So that's why I'm interested now in sort of mapping out a new sort of Habermasian idea of space, idea of space where the state is still very much you know, uh, a more important player than it is in this book. Not in the least, because now, as we have heard from the Snowden revelations, is an important part of that is that there's not just partnerships between all these different social media platforms, but also between the state and a lot of these platforms. Whether forced or not, I mean, that's really beyond the question, but uh, they're very obvious, and, you know, they've now come out into the open. Yeah, though I do want to throw one complicated factor to the mix, and that's um, that all that said, yes, the state has kind of undermined this entire, you know, media yeah. ecology. Uh, but but at, at the moment, we're watching at least the political side of the state system in the United States um, realign in, a, in an almost shocking way as, you know, the, the big business interests find that they're suddenly powerless to control these, you know, insurgent, uh, disruptive elements. Um, such that one finds oneself wondering what we mean by the state anymore and to what extent it's <laughs> different from s at least some of these grassroots networks. Yeah. So I have to find the sort of customer equivalent mm -hmm. for the state and, <laughs> and, uh, and commercial powers. I have still have to come up with a term there. But it's basically that same blurring mechanism, the boundary. I can't call it a boundary struggle because that's really what it is. There's state and commercial powers that are, you know, really, really friendly. But what you've seen lately is that uh, the big corporations, Facebook, you know, amongst them, uh, they're going to complain that the state has too much power. But what they really mean is the state has too much regulatory power, which they don't like. You know, they want them to get off their backs. And meanwhile, they're piggybacking on uh, the state's money that they invest in, you know, from especially defense money in the monitoring system. So there's really sort of an Orwellian 
you know, new speak here going on here that were, you know, the Facebooks are out, you know, with outrage over the NSA revelations and, oh, they're being misused. But, hey, it's right there that they have collaborated all along and they have to, for, to some extent, but part of that is their anti-regulatory stance, which, you know, people like Eric Schmidt, they constantly fight against regulations, especially in Europe. You may not find that so big here, but in Europe, you know, the regulation, right, regulatory fight over quite not just privacy, but over surveillance and privacy is much bigger than it is here. Mm -hmm. Partly because all of the national uh, governances, as I call them, do like a big chunk of, you know, both regulatory things and uh, more state-like uh, privacy uh, uh, regulations, um, they become sort of overruled by a global network of uh, really pushing that governance into a global system. Whereas a lot of European states, of course, you know, even if you live five kilometers across the border, you, it's called Germany, they have a completely different set of rules in terms of government and censorship than they have in the Netherlands. Now, that is totally not acknowledged by, you know, a lot of American government systems that sort of are imposed on those regulatory systems in Europe. And now I'm not even speaking about Asia or you know Russia or any of the other global powers. So that's a really complicated thing. I have a lot of colleagues in the law department in, at the Institute for Informational Law that I collaborate with, but um, I find that I'm not a legal <coughs> scholar, so I think you really need to be, you know, sort of legally and politically um, well versed to understand those mechanisms. So uh, I didn't want to bring them up for you know in this book. We find each other's perspectives very helpful, though. So, so we we talk to each other. Yes, I'd like to join um, one thread that's going through some of the questions that come here. Um, you brought up earlier on that one of your questions was users, and that didn't come up in much of your talk, and obviously in the space that you have. But you think about this through, you know, you're talking about provenance of this notion of the public which is very much dependent on a particular notion of, of, of how privacy functions in the nature of a liberal individual who can participate precisely because they have developed a notion of being an individual who has an opinion who can then participate in shaping it, right? And so I'm, I've been curious as you present here, um, and this ties back to Natasha's question too, and we look at these tensions over what shaping what and the integration of, you know, it's a push-pull. But how are you thinking about who is created through using these interfaces, right? Against the background of, of the sense of privacy that broken is, and against them, how a lot of these networks seem to function um, to atomize. Right. So just, you know, yeah, very it's not that question. Yeah, I'm just curious in sure. terms of, you know, let me give you an example. I regularly talk to like 18-year-olds, mm -hmm. <laughs> so 18 to 20-year-olds, and, you know, I talk about this stuff sometimes in different terms, but I do talk about it, and I ask them, what, the, usually the first question I get is, okay, so what? You know, privacy, is, it's really a different term to them. It doesn't mean much to them. If it means something, it's a totally different thing than what we think it means to them. So I'm really very curious to, you know, to learn how people are, who are, have basically grown up through those systems. They don't have any offline context to compare it to, really, because they were like 12 when uh, these social media mm -hmm. started to become a major part of their life. There's, you know, I think the average American teenager uses social media seven and a half hours per day or is connected to some kind of uh, tool device that connects them through you know, the, the, the ecosystem. Now that's tremendous. We, you know, we were talking about telephones before. Well, please, telephones, you know, may have been a major tool that we've seen in our lives, you know, for some time, but we never were on the phone for seven and a half hours a day. <laughs> Not only that, but it's a part of that, you know, I don't know what it's going to do to uh, the or the uh, children who grow up with this media and have basically no previous sense of what the differences between private, corporate, and state in the past really were. Because 
where you know if you don't have like an offline object like a book to give you some sort of reference as to what chapters are or uh, the, you know notions of reading in you know, one of the chapters, you don't have that in online context. So to me, it's like a total. Uh, I'm very intrigued by it, by the way, but I I cannot predict how that's going to affect online life in the future. There, there must be a different form of sociality for other people who are growing up in this ecosystem now, I'm sure. I don't know how it's going to turn out. But are there, I mean, can you make any recommendations on anyone now writing about relations between the private and the public and social media and conceptions of participation within that? Yeah, uh, Dana Boyd is doing a lot of work in that direction. Yeah. The yeah. whole group that she works with, right. both in New York and at the uh, Microsoft yeah, Center. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I think she's been on maternity leave recently, but um, yeah, she's doing a lot of yeah. work uh, and also ethnographic work in that area. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll return to her work and all the references that is surrounding her. So I think she's one of the major forces in that. Because I'm just curious about training colleagues. Yeah, she's not really a problem of no. one person, and uh, some of the people in her in her circle are though. And she's very, you know. So I can give you more references. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Do you have more questions? Sure. Um, because so much of your focus seems to be on the political economy of this, I'm thinking about the many very popular social networking sites that are not making a lot of money so far, like Pinterest. Yeah. Even Twitter, I'm not sure has really figured out. They haven't made any money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I guess, what do you make of that? You know, can you just speak yeah. to that a little bit? Well, you have to be careful saying that or assuming that they haven't made any money. They do, but you know, it's also how you present that in the IPO file. So, um, other than that, no, actually, <coughs> Facebook didn't make any money until what 2010 or 11, and even that was relatively, you know, the reason why these. Uh, companies have become so valuable is the number of users and the power that they have as portals. You know, both portals to advertisers, to but especially data companies. So, uh, how do they make their money? There's a lot of new ways of making money that you, you know, you, I, I used to compare it to the banking system. Did we know in 2008 how derivatives were? There were a lot of complex products that, you know, we were all buying. They were all like products of marketing, and we were buying into those products, and we were billions of people were using them. They sold like even in Holland, like there was this derivative product that is now called the, the dupe product. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think two million people actually out of the you know population of six million adults bought that product. You know, that was like the biggest thing in the world, and everybody bought into it. It became normal, normal. I often compare it, you know, I'm not saying that we're going to get a big bust and you know in the the social media system that we got in the banking system, but in terms of its complexity, both in terms of the business models and the algorithmic use of, you know, use of algorithms to uh, make those products, to produce them, there are a lot of similarities. And that, I was really struck by how similar those systems work to some extent, also in the sort of generate, generation <coughs> of bubbles, both economic bubbles and sort of tech bubbles, which are sort of, you know, the same thing. So, I'm curious, I don't know, you know, I should go into, uh, there's an interesting article in the New Yorker this week, which came out yesterday, which I was really want to put in here, that is into sort of discovering what uh, it's called, uh, an interesting title, oh, uh, Baby Watched. And it's looking at the Bay Area in terms of you know, all these new startups. Do they actually make money? No, they do not. But then it starts real, it is, Sort of explains how the money system still makes money when even when the companies do not make money. It's almost incredible. It's like it's falling, you know, from the sky and turning into money. But it's like this new derivative system that uh, comes with venture capital investing in uh, companies that have not gone public but that are sort of beyond, so, you know, or, or just below that going public line. It's very complicated. And halfway through the article, I thought, I'm never going to understand this. Yeah. But it's still very intriguing how it works. And to remind me again of the financial banking system in uh, pre the crisis in 08. I'm not helping you very much here. I'm well, making it more complicated. Right. Well, I'm not a financial expert. So, <laughs> so one of the uh, 
oldest form of social media in the academic world is the post-talk reception. <laughs> <laughs>